Michael D. Leonardo, also known as Mikey Scars. The government says he's a high-ranking member of the Gambino crime family. <laughs> This is No Excuses with Michael DeLeonardo. I'm your host, R.J. Roger. Michael, how you doing? Very good. Good evening, R.J. Got a good show planned today. Got a, I want to talk about some a real good mob story here today, that or Cosa Nostra story. So, is it just a surprise or something that uh, I know already? You know a little bit of this one already. <laughs> So, um, so Michael, I want to talk about first before we get into this. I want to talk about just after the um, Sammy flips major changes going on in the family. I know that you got involved in some of the things that he was formerly heading. Okay, um, let's see. There was the Shylock and business that had to collect his money. But I think, if I'm going to guess, I think it'd be more permanent would be the construction business. Yes, exactly. All right. Yeah. Uh, I used to drive Jackie up to see uh, John in MCC in Lower Manhattan. And uh, it was probably maybe late December or maybe early January. I'm not sure of the month. I know it was cold. And I drove him up there and he went to visit John after Sammy flipped. And he comes down with Pete after the visit. And uh, him and Pete come over and they say, we got a message from the boss. And I says, I thought it was just, hello, you know. He says, uh, you're going to take over Sammy's rackets with the uh, construction business. You're going to handle all construction for our family. So I was a little taken aback because I never expected it. And, uh, and he says, uh, you're going to have Eddie Garofalo, which is Sammy's brother-in-law, who is a genius and knew every, just about everybody in the construction business. The guy was great. Or could hardly write his name, but he was a genius in this business. He says, and uh, you and Eddie are going to do this. And he says, uh, I got a message from, from the boss. If you two of you fuck up, we're killing the both of you. <laughs> I went, all right. There's him <laughs> just flipped. The, the government knows about every contract, every everything. All right, let's get that jail cell ready. It's coming. Somebody's going to stop on me. And if, and if we fuck up, if Eddie robs, like he's got a, a pension to do, I may get clipped for it. So, but it was, you know, it was a proud moment that John Sr. would task me with something so enormous and so important for the family. So Pete and Jackie give me a kiss, congratulations, good luck, and all this other stuff. Yeah, you fuck up, we're killing you, but uh, congratulations, thank you. Uh, so I go out to see Junior, and the same thing, he already knew. And he says, good luck, and uh, we'll get together, we'll work it out. We stay close to Eddie, uh, learn everything you got to know with Eddie. So he was already prepped by his father that if Eddie fucked up in any way, that uh, he, Eddie had a big problem. And he wanted me to hold his pulse and learn everything I can from Eddie. So after the meeting, and before I go see John, I get in my car after I drive, drop Jackie off. I go out to Eddie's house in Staten Island. And I pull him out of the house. Now, Eddie's real nervous about everything at this point in time. Very nervous. And Eddie and I didn't have a relationship. I'm really out just hello and goodbye type stuff. Um, when Sammy was around, Eddie was a different guy. He was really confident, very assertive. Um, so I, we went to the diner, and I told Eddie exactly what I was told. And I says, Eddie, we got a shot here. Let's not screw this up. You know? And I told him, I'm here to learn everything I can from you. And uh, you're going to be completely ob uh, honest, no screwing around. And um, I think he was a little tentative because he figured I was going to learn everything, then maybe have him hurt. That's just the way that life works. But it wasn't the case at all. Uh, there was no intention to hurt Eddie unless he got caught robbing. So that's how I get involved from John Sr. into the construction business, which wound up being a headache. Because after Sammy flipped, 
I was going with Eddie to meet concrete guys, guys all different companies in the city, uh, contractors. They really didn't want to meet with anybody after Sammy because they, they had a lot of exposure with Sammy. The unions, tremendous amount of exposure with Sammy. Everybody thought they were going to prison. And here you're dealing with the contractors, basically, they're legitimate guys just working hand in glove with, you know, with, with different families throughout the, the decades. So they get the game, but they're really not criminals. You know what I mean? We do them favors. They do us favors. We make some money. They said they're not stepping out for violence and all that other stuff. So now for something that they had, there was a concrete club that exploded. And now with Sammy flipping, exploded again for, you know, for the, for the FBI. They know the FBI is going to be all over this with Sammy's info. Because he, Sammy ran the whole family construction business with every family in the city and did it well, very well. They brought in a lot of money, millions a year. So, um, you know, it was a very important thing. So now everybody's trying to stay away from us. You know, they, they really don't want to meet. And I, I feel sorry for these guys because they don't know what's going to happen. And we got to watch our backs totally when we go see these people that we don't bring more to their doorstep because they're going to know, the FBI is going to know, we're going to try to reach them all. So it was a little difficult for, I would say, the first two, three years to break that circle. And what was going on, really, you know, you had the Lucchese family, gas flipping, and you had other things going on, and different guys and different families flipping. So a lot of the FBI knew a lot was going on with construction, for sure. So what happened was there was a lot of people making side deals. It wasn't really controlled after a while. It was just everybody out there making a construction deal and, and taking down money and not turning it in. I'm not saying not everybody didn't turn it in, but there was a lot not turned in. And our family included and all the families. So, uh, you know, we included local 282 of the Teamsters. You know, they had a, a, a guy on every construction site over, uh, I think it was $2 million at that time, where they raised it to $5 million, uh, minimum for the job, uh, which was a Teamster form, and they got X amount of money a year. Uh, over time, from from minute the job starts till it closes, great job to stay on there, make a lot of money every year. And we controlled the trucks, we could shut down jobs, we worked with the other unions uh, if they had an issue. So it was a very important part putting this team's the foreman on the job. Uh, we had local twenty three, the labor's union, seven thirty one. We had a lot of unions that controlled everything, but now everybody's running around making their own deals. So it became a problem. We had Joe Brewster, who was a, a delegate in Local 23, who's been there a very long time. He wants to be my second cousin, Joe. Uh, he worked with Louis Giardina, who was the president of the union, and Louis Giardina's father had that union. Um, and he was having some issues up and getting into that office because they tried to shut Joe out. And uh, we're port uh, putting down uh, foremans and, and shop stewards, et cetera, they really would try to make themselves stand off to the rest of the family at this point and alienate Joe. So that was another issue. Uh, local 282, if the Sammy flips, there's Bobby Sasso as the president, Mike Carbone. Uh, I think it might, might have been secretary treasurer. I'm not sure of his position. But they get pinched with Sammy. So And then there's new guys put in their place. Uh, John Probian and uh, Mike Bogal. Mike Bogal wound up being the president of the local team. Uh, 282. So trying to put all these parts together was the very difficult. Um, so during the course of this, we had Johnny G and Joe Bruce and Johnny Gamarano, who was a genius in the business, just like Eddie. He was great. He was in, in low, handling local 23 for a while, along with Joe Brewster. So we had those two guys in place handling for the family, for, for that local. And Sammy, with Eddie Garfola, uh, if the DB was gone, if they killed DB, uh, they took over and handled 282 exclusively, which was Sammy. He, he, he appointed uh, stewards on the job and did just about everything. Made deals with uh, putting people on uh, the job, then working to take money from people. The, the worker, we could leave a guy off the job and they would they'd work with the contractor to get paid uh, to keep the teams through off the job split the money. So there was a lot, lot involved. Uh, sounds maybe a little confusing, but it, it was at times. Um, so with everybody out there running around, I was having difficulty 
finding the egg. Like it was like an Easter egg hunt. And between Eddie and myself, we were finding about all these side deals. We were meeting guys in other families. So Joe Watts. Joe Watts wants a handling company called Big Apple and a lot of the other construction companies out there. Joe Watts was super involved in the uh, construction business also, but he was John's friend, uh, confidant, and exclusively reported to John Sr. and John Sr. only. He was above any captain. He was well, straight direct. Even though he wasn't made, he could have been like a, a colonel or something if there was a position. Joe Watts, uh, but he had that much clout and knew the business and, every, and knew every family. You said above any captain. Yeah, he went straight to the boss all the time. My, a lot of influence over captains, yeah, absolutely. Um, so Joe Watts was, he had tasked Johnny Gamarano, Johnny G, to handle Big Apple. Now what happens just leading up there after Sammy flips, but rumors coming around are out that uh, Danny Marino, Jimmy Brown might have had something to do with gas and uh, and chin with the family overthrowing the death of Frankie DiCicco and all these things, all these little rumors flying around at the time. Who may be bad? Um, who may be an informant? We're not knowing because it was a high echelon guy. So everybody's on on a nerd, unnerved really, trying to meet people. So I get a call from uh, my brother, Frankie. And he was a Teamster foreman also. And he was a local 23 when he was a kid also. So Frankie was pretty good in the construction business. Uh, and uh, I, I put him involved with us after I got the job to handle and stay next to uh, Joe Brewster and Johnny Gamarano and anybody else in there in the family with the construction. So Joe Watts happens to call Frankie. Frankie comes to my house and he tells me, Joe Watts wants to see you and I. He's, he seems angry. So we go see Joey, meet him on uh, 7th Avenue and 92nd Street, just before you go over to Verrazano. And he's fuming, fuming. And he's fuming at Johnny Gamarano. This drunk, he's no good. I gave him, I gave him big apple, apple to handle. Uh, I gave him three, $400,000 a year to handle this. And I'm saying $300,000, $400,000 a year. We ain't see this any money, this amount of money from any one company. Level, level, level mind collectively, all the companies, we're not seeing that, that money come in right now. And here's a guy who's getting three to 400000 a year. And Joe Watts didn't exaggerate. And he was very angry. He said, I'd like to take it away and give it to you two guys. So this comes on the heels of Eddie Garofola telling me about Big Apple. He already posted me on it. A couple of weeks before, and I mentioned it to Junior uh, about this big apple, and I explained it to him, and that uh, there was some monies coming in there, and uh, Joe Watts was handling the company. But now I'm being told directly from Joey that that much money's coming in. So I go see Junior, and Junior's not happy at all, not happy, and he says, "You got to be kidding me." And then I tell him the story. You know, I went and seen Johnny G. And I asked Johnny G after the Eddie Gar Garofolo. I went and see Johnny G and I asked him, John, you got, you got your head in this company? Yeah. You making any money here? He tells me no. He lied to me. As I found out later on from Joe Watts. Why would he lie, though, if he's on record? with? I mean, what's the motive in lying here? Maybe he never thought Joe Watts would tell me. Maybe that was something they had. It's, it's on me, meaning Joe Watts. I'll handle it. You don't have to give nothing to nobody. Of course, he, he, he tried to compromise me down the road, too, and I, I could tell that story. Just remind me about it. Uh, and I think it's in my testimony also. Uh, so he could have done that with Johnny G. Don't worry about this is mine type stuff, and you, know, you don't have to give nothing to nobody. Maybe that was in Johnny G's mind. But he said he, he got no money, which he liked. So all this coming in and me bringing this to Junior, this just blew up when Joe Watts blew up. So uh, Junior tells me, get a meeting, get Jackie Nose to bring these guys in. Danny Marino, Joe Watts, Johnny Gamarano. 
And he says, if they give us the wrong answer, because like I said, there's a backdrop of a lot of things going on. There was just a buildup with Danny and uh, Johnny G. Now, just for the viewer purposes, why would Danny be involved in this? Why is Danny involved? Well, he's Johnny G's captain. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's why he's responsible for Johnny G. Okay. So that's why he would be. And again, there's a lot of other things going on that Danny Marino may be culpable in Junie's mind and my mind and others' mind. A lot of rumors flying around at this time about Danny when, when gas pipe flips. The gas pipe flips in 93. And it was the rumors about that he may have something to do with uh, Frank Chico's death, Eddie Lino, Moriello, overthrow our family type stuff. Just rumors, unfa uh, un unproven, uh, but none nonetheless out there. So he says, get a meeting. We get Jackie to go there, bring these guys in. Michael, go get a spot. If we don't like their answer or they have an attitude, we killed them right then and there. Junior said this. Yeah. That's happens. We get Junior, uh, Jackie knows, make an appointment. I picked the spot. It's in Brooklyn. It's in a friend of mine's apartment in a, in a neighborhood, second floor apartment. And um, meeting's all set. Junior comes to my house with uh, Charles Cornelia, Tommy Sneakers, uh, rings my bell, I come out. He t I tell them where to go, uh, Charles and, uh, and Tommy, where to go and park the car in the street. And Junior and I walk over to uh, this apartment. I would discuss it what's going to be, what's going to go on. And then just to reiterate, you know, we're not going to kill them unless they give they have an attitude of a bad uh, Bad answer. Now, was he prepared with to k kill and clean up? Because I, I believe I read some stuff where there was body bags in the car, guns in the car. Sure. Uh, the reason why we don't get in the car, he's, Jude just said, was that uh, there's guns in the car and, and uh, body bags. So she will let them go ahead and we'll talk about what we're going to do. So when we get to the point, apartment, Junior looks at me and goes, this place? Like, in other words, how are we going to kill two guys in this place? So it wasn't conducive to killing two guys. And so why? Now, did you know in advance of picking that apartment that there was a potential, if that meeting didn't go well, the plan was to kill these guys? Right. Did you know that before you picked the apartment? Oh, yes. I said that a little while ago. Yeah, sure. So, so why did you pick that apartment? Okay. There was rumors that somebody might have been bad. There was rumors that Joe Watts might be bad. And that Joe Watts used to tell Junior, you're the boss, when we were together. And Junior was really unnerved by Joe Watts always telling him, you're the boss. Every time we went there to talk about something, you're the boss, you make the decision. Junior would sell, tell him, Joe, I'm, I'm not the boss of nothing. So Junior was a little nervous about him at this time. I'm not saying he is. Distrusting of him. Very distrusting. And in my mind, and I think this is the first time Junior will hear it, I'll say, we're going to bring a guy on a hit that may be bad. And don't forget, there was a top echelon informant that gave up the apartment, the Ravenite, when John got pinched, where all those tapes were. Nice. And all this stuff, we had heard that there was a top echelon informant. Now, when Gravano flips, right? No need to pull that guy out. No need to force whoever that informant, or more than one. I believe there was more than one top echelon informant, for sure. They just it's never come out, has it? It's never came out who, right? No. Never. Yeah. Never. You're gonna let that out. That's interesting. I forgot about that. Who would, who would be a, a top echelon informant again if they let it out? But I think in John's case, if Sammy don't flip, they may, even with the tapes, they may force that person out. So going in lines to what Junior's suspicions were, he didn't mm -hmm. say. He said, I don't like the way this guy talks to me, Michael. As a matter of fact, we would meet him in, uh, in uh, Queens, and I would buy tokens. And we get up on the train. We go on the train, and we take a train. 
so you couldn't nobody could be sitting in the car anywhere else. And uh, that was one of my little little things I did uh, counter surveillance. I get I want uh, get tokens, give them to the guy. We all go on the train together and uh, head in one direction, and then take the train back. Talk on the train. So you couldn't do it too often, otherwise they would prepare. But if it was a sensitive conversation, that's what we did at times. So in saying that, that's something that I had in my head. If we're going to kill two guys and a guy may, may be an informant there, maybe we save it for later on. He may get a little mad at me like, what you do? But maybe he'll pass. But still, they were prepared to kill these two guys that night. Regardless, they felt they had silences and the body bags and stuff like that. It could have been done, no problem. Just a big cleanup. So Tommy Sneakers and Charles Carneglia, they knew what their role was going to be. They were there and to, they were told. Yeah, maybe okay. If things were bad, they then we put them in the apartment. There was a little dining room, and we all sat at the table. Well, they sat at the table first, then I went to go sit on the couch. And uh, which was all in close proximity. It was a little apartment. And there was a bedroom. And in the bedroom was Charles and Tommy with the guns and the body bags. So on a signal, they were going to come out and just shoot the two of them. Danny Marino and John Gavin. Okay. Now, I don't mean to cut in front of the story, but I just want to... What? Why was their consideration on killing Danny? Like I stated earlier, one is his captain. That The other one was all the other stuff that happened before. The rumors that he may involve with Jimmy Brown, over toward a family, okay. all other beefs. There was many other little beefs that Junior had taken care of, uh, meetings in hotels in Long Island. There was a lot of stuff coming up. <clears throat> Besides the lion, uh, Johnny G was very sneaky uh, with monies, holding back monies. So, you know, he was fed up. And then, then he knew he lied to me. So we were both really angry that he would lie to me. And we were looking for an answer. And uh, Junior was going to lead the interview. And uh, so we're waiting. Jackie shows up. And I bring Jackie upstairs to the apartment. And uh, I go, I says, where are they? He says, well, they're coming. So I go downstairs. And I'm waiting for them to come. And what comes up? A long black limousine. And then the limousine comes out. Now, it's a limousine driver, stranger, right? A big limousine on this quiet block in Brooklyn. Uh, draws a lot of attention, right? What's this limousine doing in front of this guy's house? Um, uh, George Lamendoza, who wasn't supposed to be there, which is Danny Marino's first cousin. Johnny G, uh, Joe Watts, and uh, Danny Marino. They all come up the stairs except for the limousine drive. He stays in the limousine. Well, that's his job, drive the car. So they all come up, and I tell John, they came on limousine. So he looks at me like, yeah, what are we going to do here now? You know, it's, it's off. You, 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 how many are going to kill Georgie Lamendoza, too? So, so why would Joe Watts show up in a limousine? Joe Watts is a very, very sharp, extremely sharp man. He knew there was rumblings about things going on. He knew Junior wasn't happy with a lot of stuff. And he, maybe I'm going to think for Joe Watts. Maybe he said, I know how to set somebody up. Maybe there's a setup. Not for him, but maybe even for him. We don't know what he had in his mind. I don't know what he had in his mind. But if anything was going to go break bad, he's going to bring a limousine, a limousine driver, an extra guy, Georgie Lomadoza, who was not invited to a high-level meeting. So he figured more people come, hey, nothing's going to happen. And he was right. That was a reason why it didn't happen. I'll explain the reason why it didn't happen. So he was I mean, he was thinking ahead. These guys could be planning to take me out. He's thinking ahead. Either that or takes the other guys out. I mean, uh, you know, he was close with Danny Marino. He was very close with him. And who knows what Joe was thinking at that time. Again, I got to think for Joe Watts, it's a little tough. The guy's extremely sharp. But I could surmise certain things. Um, but he insulated and he protected, I think, by showing up the limousine driver and bringing uh, Georgie, which he should not. He was not told to bring anybody else. So now we sit down. 
everybody says hello, everybody sits down, everybody sitting at the table. I go sit down at the couch. And Jackie's at the table, Danny, Johnny G, Joe Watts, and Junior. And Junior, Junior, uh, Junior starts to address uh, Danny and uh, Johnny G about the monies. And he's angry at this point. He can, you, they know he's angry. Joe Watts steps in and he says, John, your father gave me carte blanche. Yes, the money's there. We're making all that money. He said, we're making all that money. But your father, as you know, gave me carte blanche. This is part of it. They were going to build a war chest. Monies. All these monies are supposed to go in to fight any cases with Gravano. Like they did early on when Gravano flipped. They called in all the captains, a lot of soldiers. They were, they were asking uh, every soldier, every captain in, in the lawyer's office, like almost debriefing every. That's a whole other subject that I, I was really pissed off about. Uh, what they did with Gravano, like confess your deeds. And Joe Watts and uh, some of the other guys were leading that with the lawyers to get any inf damaging information on Gravano for future cases that you, you can attack them on. So one of the things was, you know, they were going to have everybody in the family chip in for monies. But you had multi-millionaires up there that were going to fight cases, right? Dick Brown was going to go after first. You want to get money from the little guys. So what happens, they changed it. And one of the changes were that Joe Watts was going to, whatever he earned, any way he did it, was going to, he was going to handle the war chest. The information that was there, the, the, the Battle of Gravano and his cases, and he had carte blanche, according from John Cena's mouth. It was never disputed. It's the truth. So when Joe Watts tells Junior, your father gave me permission to keep all these money, any and all monies, it was over. Junior's never going to buck his father. Wishes. Now, did Joe Watts and Jackie D'Amico, who came in a little later, know that there was two men who were present in that apartment, but not present at the table. Well, Jackie got there first. Joe Watts came with the other guys out of the Eve. They didn't get there. He didn't get there late. He came with them. Okay. They all came to make together. So what happens now, all right, they say goodbye. Everybody's happy. Well, Junior's not happy with the money. You know, he's going to keep it all. But we got a great answer. The right answer. Whether we liked it or not, about the, uh, all that money being kept by the by them guys, Joe Watts. Uh, so they go down. John says goodbye, Danny, Johnny G, and Georgie La Mendoza. They go down the stairs, and they go wait in the limousine. He tells you, Michael, tell those guys to come out of the room. I go over, open the door. I say, come on out. Now Joe Watts didn't see where I was going. He turns around when he hears noise, and his face. Now, I know Joe Watts a long time. He's never startled, never off balance. I seen his face, his face drop when he seen those two guys come out of that room. He was stunned. He knew what could have happened. Jackie, Jackie was dumbfounded, silent. He knew also at that point what could have, what was going to happen. Why those two guys hiding in the room? They know. Joe Watts goes, John, what's this? What happened? He says, Joe, if I knew you were going to bring Georgie Lemon Dose, I would have had to bring another body bag. Looked him right in his eye, right back at him. Junior said that to Joe Watts, right to his face. 